full house today. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining this joint event between the Financial Times and Bruegel on a series uh, of events in which we jointly uh, have a conversation with the Spitzenkandidaten for the next the European election starting in, uh, which will be uh, at the end uh, of May. And between now and then we will have six conversations, the names are there, and we're going to kickstart the conversation with Yanis Varoufakis uh, running for DiEM25 in Germany. Um, before we start the conversation, uh, I wanted to sh uh, share a few housekeeping rules. Uh, as I said, this is the first of six. Um, then uh, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the conversation here, but we will do this through Slido. So if you're interested in asking a question, please log into uh, uh, the, the Slido uh, program. Uh, can you change that and put out the uh, information of how to do that? You just need a code in there. Ask a question. Uh, I will be holding the questions here and I will try, I will do my best to bring the conversations of the most voted in uh, our dialogue here. Um, as you can see, Martin cannot do this because he had an accident, so I have to, I have to do that, Martin, this time around. <laughs> Maybe next, uh, next time. Uh, okay, and then we will have hopefully the last. 20 minutes uh, for Q&A for people from the, uh, the floor and we encourage you to ask as many questions uh, to today's candidate. Martin. Uh, thanks, Maria. Is this working? Can you hear me? The yeah, they will switch it on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and for the FT to, uh, to share this uh, series of events with, uh, with Bruegel. Uh, before we start today, it's just, just one word uh, about how it is a series, uh, so we'll follow a common format for six events, six Spitzenkandidaten for different political movements, all of whom are aspiring to move in at the top floor over there. Uh, <laughs> we kick off with, uh, with Yanis Varoufakis, who probably doesn't need much introduction. Um, you, you all know him, but very briefly... Uh, long career as an economist, an academic economist, uh, then moved into politics, and most famously as uh, finance minister in the Syriza government in Greece in 2015, and has since then uh, founded or co-founded uh, the Democracy in Europe movement 2025, which is a uniquely transnational political movement, uh, fielding lists in how many European Eleven. countries? Eleven countries <coughs> for the European elections. And Mr. Varoufakis is the lead candidate on the German list and also the Spitzenkandidat for Commission President uh, after the elections. So since this is a... Is there a problem with the young microphone? It's not. All right. Is that better? Yeah, right. that's better. Now it's the voice of God. <laughs> um, because it's a series for the Spitzenkandidaten and because both Bruegel and the FT are interested in policy and in particular economic policy as much as the politics, uh, we've chosen a format that really tries to get into the issues. So we'll have four sections. The first is a broad one on sustainable growth and the future of Europe. Sustainable in a very broad sense, environmental, social. We'll then move on to three more specific sections, topics. Uh, one about trade policy and the global economy. Uh, the third will be about the Eurozone and the EU economy. Uh, and the fourth about competition, competition policy, industrial policy, innovation policy. So these are all fields you will realize where the Commission actually has some significant power, which is why it's relevant to ask the Spitzenkandidaten what they want to do in each of those fields. In each section, you know, send your questions on Slido, but in each section we'll try to stick to questions that relate to that topic, and then at the end it can open up a bit when we'll do a Q&A in the, in the audience. Uh, so I'll ask Maria to, uh, to kick start. off. Let's just all welcome Yanis Varoufakis, and uh, Maria will kick us off for Indeed. the first segment. Thank you, Martin. And Mr. Varoufakis, thank you very much for joining us today. Therefore, the first the kicks off discussion on these issues. Uh, as Martin said, the first question, uh, the first theme of our conversation is on the growth agenda. And you can, we will ask you to shape it in whichever way you think is appropriate for it. It is a general agenda. It's about how you generate growth uh, in Europe. I just wanted to give you a sense a little bit about how we see the numbers. And you can tell us how you want to move this forward. Um, we are 
in a much better position now in Europe uh, than we were 10 years ago, and that's uh, given, of course, uh, the, the size of the shock that we had. Uh, possibly the business cycle position is a little bit unfavorable right now, but we are in a stronger position, more resilient position than we were in 2010. But there is a problem of productivity in Europe, uh, and if, particularly if you compare that to the US, in particular to, to China, you will see that Europe is a productivity laggard. And if you want to talk about growth, as I'm sure you will, you need to have an idea of where productivity will come from in the context of a transformative era with a digital, geopolitical, multilateralism. All of these issues that we will come, we'll have an opportunity to go in a little bit further down the line are actually debated and there is an uncertainty as to where the new normal is going to lead to. In your view, where, how do you propose, and particularly if you were to become the president of your commission, how would you set a growth agenda that is going to tackle the lagging of productivity in Europe? To begin with, thank you for the invitation, Maria, Martin, Bruegel. Uh, I have benefited personally enormously from reading the staff papers that come out of this fine institution for years now. A reader of the Financial Times ever since I was too young. Uh, yes. Not necessarily a good thing, but I have. It's like Jacob rees -Mogg. That's one thing you have in common. I was trying to be polite about it. <laughs> and you are beginning to insult me by such analogies. Um, since you mentioned uh, the dreaded gentleman, uh, I think that we all here should send a message of solidarity with our friends in the United Kingdom for what it is that they are going through. And to always say to them that uh, they will always be part of Europe, independently of this dog's Brexit of a process. Okay. To your question, Maria. To begin with, we have to be honest with each other. Yes, things are better than in 2010, but this is not saying much. Because 2010 was a complete colossal catastrophe. We had inflicted a, a grave wound upon the European Union. European capitalism uh, received a self-inflicted injury in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011 with catastrophic policies from the European Central Bank and fiscal policies that made a bad thing worse. The fact that we may be better today than we were in 2010 is not something to celebrate because we're not that much better. Let me just point out that we, are, we entered the upturn of the business cycle much later than the rest of the world, than the United States, and we exited it much earlier. So we wasted one of the cycles of the international capitalist economy. Europe is falling behind, both in terms of productivity, as you said, but also and those are, go hand in hand, in terms of investment. Investment is spectacularly low, especially in comparison with the excess liquidity in the finan financial sector. And that is a major worry, because investment is the key to productivity, it is the key to development, it is the key to our capacity as a continent to uh, um, meet our uh, goals for the green transition, which is essential not just for saving the planet, but also for decoupling ourselves from dependency from Vladimir Putin, from Lignite, from um, a, a, an industrial policy that has been ridiculous regarding the auto industry, for instance, you know, putting all our eggs in the diesel basket at a time when this the industry is dying anyway and should be dead in particular. Uh, but let me be precise in what our um, political vehicle, the European Spring, that is running across Europe, that DiEM25 has put together with all our partners across Europe. Uh, we launched, by the way, yesterday at the wonderful Bazaar Theatre. Uh, and it was wonderful to have all those representatives from Portugal, from Finland, from, uh, from Denmark, from Greece, from France, from Belgium, putting forward uh, answers to questions like yours that are common to all of us answers that will be the foundation of our common platform and program across Europe. This is the beauty of the European Parliament elections. It's a journey, not a destination. It doesn't matter really what happens in the European Parliament, as far as I'm concerned. What matters is that we can have this discussion in every country in Europe at the same time with the opportunity 
of the European Parliament election. So, let me put it very simply. We need 5% of um, GDP, Eurozone GDP, to be invested every year in good quality, green transition related jobs. It is essential not just to create good quality jobs, because every day in Europe we are destroying good quality jobs and we are replacing them with precarious positions. Every day we are missing opportunities to catch up on the front of automation and renewable energy with the Chinese and with the, even with the United States. Uh, every day we are falling behind this way. The only way to answer your question, to make up for this shortfall, is 5% of additional net investment in high quality green jobs. Where will the money come from? Well, we have an idea, and I would like to hear Martin's view on this and your view on this. It can't come from taxation, at least not in the short run. We're not against increasing taxes and harmonizing taxes, it is all very important. But anyone who says that we can have a genuine boost of productivity and green investment out of increasing taxes in the short run is delusional. But we have a magnificent institution in Europe. It's called the European Investment Bank. You're all familiar with it. It has the capacity to issue uh, bonds worth 500 billion every year for five years with the support of the ECB. Imagine a press conference where the European Union Council President, Mr. Tusk, the European Investment Bank President, and the European Central Bank are presented, and they make this announcement that we're going to create a fund for investing into Greek, green energy, not Greek, green energy, <laughs> green transport, uh, transition in manufacturing, especially the auto industry, and agriculture, away from the CAP catastrophic tendency of reproducing problems and browning our fields. And th that fund is going to be funded through EIB bonds. The ECB will be standing by in the secondary markets ready to purchase them if yields spike above a certain level that we can define what it is. Uh, and this will go into a green transition works agency, a new agency by the European Union, something similar to the agency that the United States introduced in Paris, which then became the OECD, in order to channel the funding of Marshall Aid. So, so can, I, can I, if I may, uh, so 5%, if I can get in this 500 number. 500 five, five this the EIB will do this through levering up, or there will be a transfer budget? EIB bonds, so net issuance of 500 billion. And the so, underwriter will be the ECB? No, the underwriter. The ECB makes an announcement that if yields spike beyond, you, you don't need to call it an underwriter because there's no commitment. Just an announcement. That announcement would be enough. Why is that it would be enough? Because if you've got, yeah, think about it now. German pension funds are being crushed by negative interest rates. There is excess liquidity. Now, soak that liquidity up with EIB bonds. The announcement by the ECB will be enough in order to ensure that those who are now um, keeping their money at neg negative interest rates or zero interest, uh, interest rates would buy those EIB bonds. Think about it. Think about it. I mean, let's remind ourselves of the fact that there is a, a shortage, a scarcity of safe assets in Europe. It, I mean, if, if it need be, they should be, if they are spread sure. by the spike up for whatever reason. But the announcement but, uh, will make sure that they will not need to do it. If the ECB remains credible, of course. And by the way, this, well, yes, the ECB will remain credible. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. Uh, this is yeah. one of the th points of agreement between Mario Draghi and me. Now, um, look, the, the, the simple point is that what I just yeah. um, um, related to you, proposed, already happens. The AIB issues bonds. The ECB, since March 2015, has been purchasing EIB bonds. Uh, all we're saying is, use this alliance, which already exists and which is completely legal within the rules both of the ECB and the European Union okay. treaties, in order to soak up the liquidity and fund the productivity growth that you okay. asked me about. No, this so is so you, you, you've been admirably concrete uh, in answer to a very really broad and vague question, you know, the future of Europe's sustainable growth. You've said the main problem is a shortfall of investment, and you have a concrete proposal for how to address that, a huge, hugely ramped up EIB program, 
uh, bond finance, green investments. Uh, I'd like to ask you two questions, really, about that. One is, uh, in what ways do you see the principal difference of this from what already exists? I have in mind the Juncker Fund. We already have vehicles for bond finance investments. Is it the scale? Is it the direction of the investments? Is it that the EIB would be the one picking the investments? And is that not something to worry about? Is the EIB capable of a hugely scaled up investment effort and picking the right projects uh, with, you haven't mentioned private sector participation in the selection of projects, just in the financing. So that's one question. How is that how is it different from what we already have, and isn't it dangerous? So that before you come sure. up with yeah. the second one, because I'll forget the first question. It's a very important one. Okay, firstly, the Juncker plan um, was a fraud. Most of the money in the Juncker plan was um, earmarked for something else, and it was um, redeployed. Secondly, the new part of it was effectively um, a kind of insurance policy, for risk takers in the private sector, when the problem was never risk aversion by the private sector, the problem was that the private sector did not see the business opportunities in order to take these risks on its own. Uh, the, EIB, the, the, the beauty of, you'll allow me to say, of, the, of this program that we are proposing, for, of a partnership between the AIB and the ECB, is that it is completely straightforward. It's completely plain vanilla. There is no securitization. There are no different tranches, like in the Juncker plan, where you've got tranche one, tranche two, a little bit of the EIB, a little bit of this, a little bit from this program. Complexity, we should have learned that lesson from 2008, is not a good guide in the middle of a crisis. EIB bonds, everybody knows what they are. They are credible. They are triple A rated. The ECB has been buying them. The ECB's credibility, you can tell, has not been damaged by the fact that it printed 2.7 trillion to buy questionable assets. Whereas now, what we are suggesting is not to buy questionable assets, but to buy genuine EIB copper plated bonds. The second point in your question, which is very important, and I need to clarify that so that there's no confusion. Nobody says that the EIB should pick the projects. The EIB cannot do that. Uh, they don't have the capacity to increase the portfolio of their projects. This is why we are proposing the creation of a Green Transitions Works Agency. So the EIB will be funding, will be creating the funding basis for the agency's work the purpose of which will be to identify the areas. We need a common energy union. Somebody has to design that. I do believe that the European Union has the capacity to create a green transition works agency that will design this properly if it is funded. So the EIB ECB uh, collaboration funds it and the new agency implements it. Chosen by a public agency, it's not about subsidizing market market based, privately chosen, but, but qualifying investments. Think of the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was the greatest boost to private enterprise in the history of Europe. It was public money, it was channeled through a public works age, pan European agency in Paris. And it benefit it created new private enterprises and boosted existing ones. Why can't we do the same thing? And in a way that saves the planet, decouples Europe's energy supply from Russia, and creates good quality jobs. So if I may, because we are running, uh, are we running out of time on this theme, but uh, there's an interesting question. I wanted to go back to the sustainability part of it. Of course, the green component is a huge part of your agenda. Give us two more steps. You gave us one step, but how would you promote the green agenda and ensure that the EU goes carbon free? Well, Investing in green transition is not enough. We need caps on physical growth. I want to see infinite growth when it comes to education, to the health service that fixed Martin's uh, arm so beautifully the other day, uh, caring for elderly people, for communities. We can have massive growth there, um, digital technologies, um, the arts, culture, they can grow forever. But the amount of carbon dioxide that we emit, the amount of cement that we use, the amount of fossil fuels that we dig out of, of, of our land, of the earth, those must be capped. And within those limits, we must also 
um, have a taxation policy. Think, of, uh, think about the Gilets Jaunes in, in France. Uh, they were um, inspired by the increase in the, in, in the diesel tax. Now, I want to see diesel taxes, we, okay, um, diesel taxes quadruple. But I don't want to see uh, a family in rural France that can't make ends meet have to pay that huge tax when at the same time they switch on television they find out that the, the tax on the wealth tax for the rich is coming down. So we believe in neutral taxation. So increased quadruple yeah, boost uh, diesel taxes, carbon taxes, but at the same time make it a neutral tax so you return this to the poorer Europeans so they can feel that Europe is working for them, it is giving them the opportunity to go green. On distribution, that's of course I understand that there will be distribution elements there. But if I understand you correctly, you do foresee an uphaul of the in industry in Europe in order to put the physical caps that you deem necessary in order for Europe to decarbonize. Now we'll come back to some it's of this. It's a great business of opportunity okay. for private enterprise yeah. to. You see, there are two okay. ways of maximizing efficiency. Yeah. One is to keep the denominator constant and try to boost the numerator. The you. other is to keep the numerator constant and reduce the denominator. Sure. No, well, it's clear. I think we should move to the three now topics which are specific to the competence of the European Commission and something that we would ask you to give us a view on. First one is trade. Martin, yeah, you can so, lead us. So let's talk about trade because trade is perhaps where the European Commission has the most uh, autonomy or at least independent power to push an agenda. I think, and also trade is very important for Europe, I think we have a slide coming up that just shows uh, the importance of, of trade for Europe. But we've had, yeah, so this is the, uh, this shows uh, this, the, the, the amount of trade in trillion euros, uh, total exports from EU countries. If you look at the right, that's uh, intra-European trade, just to illustrate how the European, the collaboration that the European project has been is very largely an economic trade collaboration. The trade inside Europe dwarfs uh, global trade between the big trading blocks. But even European extra EU trade is as big as China and bigger than the US. So just to focus minds on how important this area is. Now, in the last couple of years, uh, certainly after, the, after Brexit, the re Brexit referendum and the election of Trump, you've seen the Commission trying to double down on a trade liberalization, being a trade leader agenda. At the same time, it's been quite willing to retaliate against the protectionism from the Trump administration, uh, both of which have been controversial. Remember the controversy around the CETA agreement. There's a lot of nervousness and disagreement about how exactly to react to Trumpian protectionism. If there were a Varoufakis commission, what would its trade agenda be? We are firm believers in the importance of trade and in free trade. The problem we have is that in the last 20 years, a lot of issues that have nothing to do really with trade have been um, subsumed into the trade agenda. So it's one thing to say we want free trade of goods and services. It's quite another to accept the legal or paralegal processes of TTIP and various other free trade agreements where you have uh, the uh, authority of national parliaments, of the European Parliament, being usurped by a shadowy private sector-based adjudication pro program, uh, process whereby whole governments, even the European Union, can be taken to task by multinational corporations whose patents or um, rights in their own conception. This refers to investor state dispute exactly. settlement. So let's separate the two. Um, our administration, if we ever have this chance, is going to be a great supporter of boosting trade while at the same time have, having transparency and maintaining a democratic process by which to control the rules of trading, the rules of uh, um, uh, constraining the ways in which, for instance, multinational companies will want to introduce um, chlorinated chicken in Europe or to introduce uh, uh, genetic engineering that goes against the edicts that we have agreed as citizens. That's point number one. You mentioned trade wars. We're very worried about trade wars. Trade wars are detrimental to the interests of, of the planet, 
of humanity. But look at the way in which Donald Trump has managed to divide Europe and increasingly to rule over us. I'll just give you an example, which you know very well, because I've read about it also in the Financial Times. Uh, cars. Donald Trump threatens to slap a 25% tariff on uh, German cars coming into, in, in, into the United States. And suddenly, a division line emerges in Europe because Angela Merkel, in, in a panic mode, says to Trump or indicates to the American administration, look, this is terrible, let's not do that, let's go to 0%. Now, 0% sounds good. I'm not in favor of tariffs, personally speaking, right? Uh, but immediately, President Macron freaks out because it's the end of Peugeot and Renault, because they face significant competition from Korean cars, Japanese cars, something that is not the case for... So the point I'm making is, with one announcement or threat from President Trump, you have divisions deepening and multiplying within Europe. So our trade policy is never going to be successful as long as we are not more united and more integrated in Europe, as long as we do not have an industry policy in Europe which is capable of creating a commonality of interests in France and in Germany in particular, but of course the rest of Europe. Uh, may, 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 if I may, on this very issue, let's stay with cars, because I think this is yeah. something that is a very real, uh, a, a very real threat, right? It could very well be, and the probability is non-zero, that in two months from now we have uh, indeed tariffs on cars. Now, I'm asking you as a future uh, president of the European Commission, given the divisions that you just described, what would be your recommendation to that, given that on the aluminium and the, on the aluminium uh, we have actually retaliated in proportional terms in line with a very clear strategy, what would be your, your recommendations in terms of how to deal with the possibility of, of tariffs coming from, you, from the US administration? What I was saying is a partial answer, not a complete answer to what you're saying. The point I'm making is that Yes, we need to retaliate. Yes, we need to make Donald Trump understand that he cannot get away with murder. But our capacity to retaliate is undermined by the divisions within us. And when you have a French president and a German chancellor who try to send messages to Trump independently of the commission and independently of one another, we are, uh, we are allowing Trump to divide and rule over us. So we need an industry policy that creates the commonality of interests and also the coordination between us that will enable us to retaliate because at the moment the commission is being undermined by the divisions within Europe and the capacity of Donald Trump to divide and rule over us. I, I understand that and the best approach would come to that and I think it's a very important issue. But, but in the short run you, yeah. you do put in retaliatory tariffs or costs. That's, That's what you would try to do. At the same time... Well, while you're trying to build uh, 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 unity uh, around it. Yes. But uh, there's also another dimension I need to, un to, to add to this. Uh, when it comes to cars, we are vulnerable. Because as Donald Trump so cleverly said, not cleverly, correctly said, you can not lose a trade war if you have a huge deficit. So the whole posture of the Eurozone in particular must be reconsidered in the context of our trade policy. To put it simply, Martin, if you are running a very large current account surplus, effectively you are asking for trouble. You are entrusting, firstly, a lot of your capital to foreigners, to non-Europeans, because you have to export capital if you have a, a steady current account surplus. That reduces your capacity to then retaliate, retaliate against them. Secondly, because this is always heterogeneous, not every country in the European Union has the same current account surplus, as you know, uh, this means that this de deepens the divisions amongst us. So, in other words, what I would do is I would ask for a holistic game plan of how to deal with threats coming from Donald Trump. It's not enough to talk just about tariffs. It's not enough just to talk about industry policy. We need to talk about fiscal policy. When fiscal policy is effectively pushing our macroeconomic dynamics into a current account situation, it makes us vulnerable when it comes to negotiating with somebody like Donald Trump, whose dream is 
to make Europe divided and reactionary. The European Commission has tried hard to reduce uh, the surplus of countries that have had uh, sustainable surpluses, but it hasn't been very effective. Really? How did they do that? Uh, well, no, they haven't succeeded. That no, they well. haven't even tried. <laughs> well, there is, the, there is the MIP. About that. Yeah, well, there is the MIP procedure. Yeah, and, and they have procedure. completely and utterly disregarded it in a scandalous way that will always be remembered by Europeans as a, a major moral failure by the Commission. So how would you do it differently? We would actually do it. They're not doing it. <laughs> You know, firstly, you we, ex granular? we agreed on having, and I don't understand why, yeah. an asymmetrical rule when it comes to imbalances. Okay. So, you know, yeah. if, if you have a deficit of more than 4%, oh, that is terrible. But if you have a surplus of more than 4%, it's fine, uh, up to 6%. And then when the deficit goes to 8.5%, I've just mentioned a dumb number, you know, at random, <laughs> then uh, we, we turn a blind eye to this violation. So when the rules are being eclectically imposed, yeah. then effectively what we are signaling to Europeans and to the rest of the, the world is that raw brutish power has taken the place of democratic process. So you would put in place sanctions? You would use the sanction instrument or the monitoring instrument to say this surplus has come Look, down. I come from a country that was crashed because we were refusing to reduce a 200 euro a month pension to 120 euros. We were crashed for that. I think I answer your question. Uh, no, so so you would. The, the answer is yes. You would Absolutely. use uh, whatever power the commission come has. I would down like a ton of bricks right. on those who bend rules that we all agree should be uh, respected. And I would do exactly the same thing when it comes to xenophobic, racist practices by European Union member states that are ridiculing Europe's uh, common uh, values and are making a laughingstock of us in the eyes of progressive humanists around the world. And you think you'd get this through the council? Life is not meant to be easy. <laughs> but we're here to try. Can I ask one other trade question? We'll come back to, to fiscal rules and so on. But uh, since we've mentioned Brexit, what sort of trade relationship would you offer Britain? By the time, by the, time of the elections, probably Britain will have left the EU, but assuming it will have. Uh, we'll be negotiating a future relationship where trade will be a big part. What will be the relationship you offer on trade? Yeah. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, our movement fought in Britain, and me personally, uh, before the referendum against Brexit. No one can accuse me of being a lackey of Brussels, as you know. This, therefore, a lot of people's eyebrows were raised when I was going around Britain arguing against Brexit and in favour of a radical remain. So that's, with this said, let me answer your question. We think that uh, given the messy process we are in, non-process we are in, at this moment, what we should be encouraging all sides of British politics to do is uh, for Britain to stay in the customs union and the single market and all we plus agreement for an indefinite period, which is not, doesn't mean that it's last, it has to last forever. A small C conservative process. They voted, sadly, to exit the European Union. We need to respect that. There's no time for a second referendum without having European Parliament elections first. To ask people in Doncaster, Clacton on Sea and Leeds to vote in a European Parliament election would be incred incredibly divisive. At the same time, a no deal Brexit um, Theresa May's a ridiculous deal with Brussels uh, cannot be fathomed, really, by a majority of people in Britain um, or by us at DiEM25. So a small C conservative uh, solution would be, formally, Britain is out of the EU, it stays in the single market, it stays in the customs union, and that gives the British people an opportunity to have the... Um, People's debate, which is necessary before a second referendum, that can then decide in five years' time, six years' time, three years' time, however long it takes for them to have this conversation amongst themselves, whether they want to rejoin the EU or to do something else. The, the backstop will remain in place in the background, the Irish backstop? Well, if they are in the customs union, the single market, we can forget about that silly backstop. <laughs> Even if they end up leaving? Later. Well, look, can, can you stop Norway from leaving um, the EFTA region? But there's no equivalent of the IRA in Norway. No, but there is, you know, a border with Sweden. 
there is uh, the, the, the point I'm making is this. There is no way you can convince the people of Britain to accept that they will be held by Brussels into a customs union forever. The, forever is a very long time. And, you know, to, I don't even believe that there is any international court that would be able to police such an agreement, even if the British Parliament consented to it. What I think where Brussels is right is when Theresa May draws those silly red lines, she says, I want to get out by 2021. I don't want a hard border in, in Ireland. Uh, I want to end freedom of movement, but I want every part of the cake and eat it. Brussels has to say what it says. The backstop was important. You know, say, look, you're going to leave in two years, but at least you need to, 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 to guarantee that there will be no hard border because of the IRA, because of the, oh, don't forget the Protestant uh, terrorists. Huh? It's a two-way process there. Uh, so I understand why Mr. Barnier had to be firm on the backstop. But if Britain agrees to staying indefinitely in the customs union and the single market, we can move on from there. Move on a minute, but on, on the trade issue, you came quite strong against the current U.S. Um, administration trade policy vis-à-vis -vis Europe. You came out very strong also as a free trader, provided there are issues that are satisfied. Do you think that the European antagonism against the U.S. is a way of preserving the EU's interest in the global setting? And by that I mean the multilateral system engaging with the rest of the world. Uh, I need to stop in a minute. But I mean, uh, is the EU strategy correct to antagonize the U.S. and up to what, up to what point? Well, it's not the EU that antagonized the U.S. You had a president elected in the White House that antagonized uh, every decent human being on this planet, including the EU, right? Uh, the question is, what do we do about it? Yeah. And we have been um, remiss. We have been reactive. We have been divided. We say silly things. I mean, I've heard the European Commission talk about the importance of turning the euro into a reserve currency, where, you know, I mean, that's pie in the sky stuff. People in the United States, whether they are supporters of Donald Trump or not, look at us and they laugh, because there is no way you can have a reserve currency if you don't have a safe asset in Europe, a euro bond, or some kind of, you know, piece of paper that people can actually buy if they use your currency as a reserve currency. So we say silly things around the world while at the same time pretending that we are going to fight against Donald Trump, we are undermining our own position. Martin, shall I move on to the next? Uh, or? We, we should move on, I think. I think we should move yeah. on, yes. We need to go to the euro area reform. I'm sure this is a th this is a topic that you've thought about, <laughs> and we've touched about it a lot. But but uh, but I, I would like, in the spirit of the conversations that we have in now, that we we do stick with this uh, idea of what is the Commission and, and your role as as a future Commission president. The role of the Commission is to initiate legislation and to preserve the treaties. This is this is what your new job description would look like if you were to get there. So I think almost immediately upon appointment, you will have to go uh, and do the, the fiscal compact and the MIP process, the process that you said was so ineffective and silly. You also talked about uh, uh, not an eclectic use of rule, but an enforcement of rule. So let's go on the fiscal side and talk about enforcement of rules. I, I, I believe you, you will. How would you go about and ensure that the commission that is at for many people, is starting from a low point in terms of the credibility of enforcing those rules, has been selective in a way of enforcing them. How would you change that and ensure that we enforce the rules? Look, Maria, the Commission has been in an impossible position because when legislators or past commissions or the Council <coughs> write rules that are violated by life and by the economy, and that there is nothing you can do but violate. I mean, think about 2009, 2010. Think of Ireland, not Greece, Ireland. They were the blue-eyed boys and girls of the European Commission. They had a, a debt-to-GDP ratio of 25%. They had uh, surpluses in their budget. They were much more order liberal than Germany. Okay? And then suddenly, the banking system just goes to pieces. And Jean-Claude Trichet, in his infinite wisdom, I don't mean that, <laughs> picks up the phone and threatens the Irish Prime Minister that the ATMs will stop functioning unless there is this cynical transfer of the losses of 
banks, some of them which were already dead, onto the books of the public. And suddenly, you have 120% debt to GDP ratio. Suddenly, you have a violation of the rules. Now, this rule could never have been respected because it was written in order to be violated. Uh, similarly, when it came to, for instance, you know, when I was in, in the ministry, I remember uh, there was a moment when I had to repay the IMF and repay the European Central Bank, and there was no, no money to do it. And the European Central Bank was simultaneously reducing the uh, limit, the limit, the, the amount of money that uh, the, the, the commercial banks in Greece could invest in uh, treasury bills of the state while also asking for me, as the Minister of Finance, to pay back the ECB for bonds that Trisha had purchased. At that point, they were violating their own rules with the proposals they were coming to me with. And you know what the proposals were. That I should allow the private banks to issue IOUs of billions, given in view of the fact that they were bankrupt, yeah? while at the same time asking me as the finance minister to give a guarantee to the, those. So a, the finance minister of a bankrupt state was meant to be uh, uh, underwriting the IOUs of bankrupt banks so that we can then take those IOUs and give it to the ECB to give us liquidity, to give it back to the ECB. Now, what can the European Commission do? What can Mario Draghi do when you have all these rules and institutions that are not fit for purpose? So, what, to answer your question, what do we do? What would I be doing? I would say, okay, first, we need to stabilize the Eurozone economy. First, we need to move away from the silliness of the fiscal compact, which, as you know, from a macroeconomic point of view, uh, to, to impose on Italy at a time of uh, renewed in, uh, recession, uh, additional austerity, on the basis of a rule that macroeconomically can never be defined in any way that does not involve a political decision as to what the structural surplus is, right? This, this is, can never be observed. It is always going to be politically decided what it is. In other words, you are politicizing decisions that are supposed to be technocratic. So what we need is to bring Europe out of this imbalance. At the moment, as we speak, what I would say to the European Parliament, to the European Commission, to the European Council is this. We have countries where the growth rate is below the average interest rate, and we have countries where the growth rate is above. As long as we have that, we have imbalances that are increasing, and we have centrifugal forces that are tearing us apart, and they are the best gift for somebody like Matteo Salvini. We need to stop this. This is why we need to integrate the answer to your question with the Green New Deal, with the increase of investment that will allow us to lessen and to reduce the macroeconomic imbalances. That's the first thing you need to do. And the second thing is to have the discussion we never had about how we need to rewrite the rules in a way that we can then aspire to staying within them. Because when you have rules that can never be respected, then you have arbitrary power. Then you have poor Mario Draghi trying to find a way of bending the rules in a way that is politically sustainable. But he cannot respect his own rules. If, if he tried to respect his own rules, then there would be no Eurozone today. So this is a deep reform program that yeah. involves rewriting treaties and so on, and many people will agree with you on it, but you still have to, as Commission President, you would still have to do the day-to-day decision-making. Uh, so how do you... You have a vision for how things could be made better. You still have to act in the short term. So you know, take one example. From what I understand from what you're saying, the budget that Italy proposed uh, last autumn, you would not oppose it. Oh, no, your no, com your would. commission would. would have said, this is fine. No, no, no. No, I'm not taking sides here on the side of Salvini. I prefer to die than do that. Uh, <laughs> I do. Now, let, let me answer this. It is important as President of the European Commission, to try to respect the rules, because otherwise you lose credibility, especially in a place called Germany. Yeah? But at the same time, you have to do it in a way that helps our social economy, doesn't damage it. So let me answer your fantastic question very precisely. What would I have done when facing the new government in Italy last year? I would have said to them, firstly, 
your tax cuts out. They are not growth oriented. The last thing that rich people in Italy who are sending their money to Luxembourg and to Frankfurt need is a tax cut. So that comes out. Your program for uh, removing poverty, the, they call it basic income. It's not basic income, it's just a, a, a kind of an, an unemployment benefit, yes. That goes ahead. The problem with Italy is that it lacks investment. You cannot fund investment through taxation because of the fiscal rules and so on. So here is a deal. We reduce your deficit beyond, below the 2.4% you want, closer to the fiscal compact rules in order to show respect for the rules, even if we don't like the rules. And at the same time, we inject investment funding into Italy, as well as into other countries, through this collaboration between the European Investment Bank and the European Central Bank, which is outside the fiscal compact process. Therefore, it is completely legal, and it is uh, beneficial not just to Italy, but to the rest of Europe. Is that a quid pro quo? They get more, they get more investment yes. from the EIB if they agree they to be sensible yeah. when it comes to their own budget. But that was not in place. Huh? It was, it, that wouldn't have been in place last year. So the question was, what would you well, have done Well, if I were the president of the European but Commission, but it but would be But that's my point. Place. That is my point. My point is but that that's only one press conference. So, you don't so need treaty changes or anything like that. That's the beauty of it. But, but this sounds like the old German idea of sort of uh, contracts for reforms, just maybe with slightly I different content. I don't mind content. contracts. I love contracts. I, don't, I, I mind silly contracts. You know, what, what the contract <laughs> that, that was imposed upon my country, uh, I, I mind because it was like, look, uh, we are going, you're bankrupt. We'll, we'll pretend you're not bankrupt. We'll give you the largest loan in, in history uh, and you will shrink your income by 25%. That is a stupid contract. If so ju just to understand it very clearly, you would be saying we will direct the EIB to put more investment into your country if you redesign your budget in ways that we see, we think is more conducive to growth. Why not? Isn't that a good idea? Is it democratic? And also, uh, it's absolutely democratic. Because what you're saying is, uh, you need investment. Uh, in any case, look, I'm a Greek, right? I mean, almost Italian. So as a Greek and, and almost Italian, I don't trust the Greek state. And I certainly, by association, I don't trust the Italian state. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if you come to Greece, for instance, right? Look at the Athens metro and look at the bridge connecting the Pel Peloponnese to the mainland. I'm, ma I'm making this point because one was created through um, structural funding that went through the Greek government, the metro. It took 10 years longer and cost three times as much. And if you look at the bridge, magnificent bridge, very beautiful bridge, do you know that one? This is connecting the Peloponnese to the mainland. EIB, on budget, um, on time. So I don't see why this is undemocratic, especially if we Europeans have enabled the next European Parliament and the next European Commission through the program of the European Spring and DiEM25 to do precisely that. We need to move on, actually, if I may. On the, uh, they have a map here which, which is designed on to show the performance in, uh, in Europe in terms of convergence. Uh, and what you see here is uh, as red or slightly orange are the ones that are underperforming, and here is on, done on GDP growth. And what is green is, uh, or is, is, is performed by vis-a-vis -vis the past, is performing above uh, its, uh, its trend line. This is uh, the environment in which, as an ex-president commission, you will have to come in. You see regional actual divergences, not only country divergence. So that is, of course, an interesting dimension for the commission to think about how to enable regional convergence, not only country convergence. But I want to talk a little bit about the conditions in which, if you were to become the, the president of the commission, you will have to operate. Next to that, you have the debts. I know the debts are a topic you think about uh, uh, with, with great attention, not only on the fiscal side, but on the private side. But the fact of the matter is that the debts in Europe have got, have given Europe a very bad starting point in terms of investments. Investment is key in everything you said, but in order to, to do investments, you need to incur more debts. And we are starting from a very disadvantageous position, both on the fiscal side, so the governments across Europe, with variations, and important variations, are very highly indebted, uh, but also on the private side, we have huge debts. So they, they, they the, the agenda for growth and investment needs to happen, needs to be implemented under a, starting from a position which is very unfavorable. And given the growth agenda, given the growth performance that you see here, how do you propose to promote this investment agenda um, in, in, in your next leadership? Well, that's a brilliant point, and you're quite right. Debt and convergence have to be looked at as symptoms 
or parts of the same system of equations, of the same process. Uh, what is fun fundamentally uh, insightful about this picture is if you think, it, it come to think of it, the euro was in the end pointless because the greatest convergence did not happen within the eurozone. The greatest convergence happened between the um, successful countries in the eurozone, like Germany and the Netherlands, and countries like Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. That is where you have a remarkable convergence. Now, why did that happen? Of course, it had nothing to do with the currency. It had to do with the fact that there was a lot of um, for, uh, direct investment from German industry and Dutch industries and Austrian industries into Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Whereas Portugal, Greece, Ireland, what did we get? We get a tsunami of loans, private loans initially, mostly, but also in the case of Greece, uh, public loans, which it, it, that doesn't really matter that much because in Ireland the money went from Frankfurt to from private banks to Anglo-Irish, from there to the developers, then the thing blew up and we went back to the uh, accounts, the public accounts, became public debt. In Greece it went directly into the Greek state. The Greek state gave it to developers to build roads at exorbitant prices and Olympic works and so on, right? Olympic Games uh, facilities. Uh, in, the end, we, in the end, we have a Eurozone that has created um, uh, a mass, a flooding of uh, loans into the periphery. Those were unproductively invested, created bubbles, they collapsed, and that goes hand in hand. You see, this is the, the bridge, you know this very well. This is what connects the high levels of private and public debt in the countries that did not manage to converge, unlike Hungary, Czech Republic, and Poland. So this is why I keep insisting right from the beginning that even though we like to com compartmentalize the discussion, you know, trade, the euro reforms, convergence, uh, uh, and debt, these are, this is one thing. We should have a holistic approach to this. Uh, when money goes from a Frankfurt bank account, bank account, bank, to a Greek bank, and then it becomes a bubble of real estate in Athens or Thessaloniki, right? That means no convergence and at some point unsustainable debt. So we we need a debt structure to begin with, when because we have this legacy of unsustainable private and public debts. We need a debt structure. And at the same time, we need an industry policy, an investment policy that is pan-European to prevent the new bubbles from forming and bursting, and also to help absorb some of the losses and the debts. Just, follow, just to follow up on this, because your holistic approach in your party program has, has a lot of radical concrete proposals. So one is for this debt restructuring to take place through a refinancing of public debt with long-term low-interest ECB loans that would presumably require huge political intervention, possibly treaty change. Another element is a, is a tax on, on net current account surpluses, and capital exporters, in what you call a, uh, a political surplus recycling mechanism, which also would be seen, certainly in Germany, as a, as a huge scale of, of interference and economically punitive of, of success. But these are the sort of things that you're proposing. I mean, how do you, how do you hope at all to be able to move in that direction? Through dialogue and persuasion, certainly not through force, uh, and, and also you, you through do accept these would take huge legislative changes. You see, right? you mentioned the surplus recycling mechanism. This is for the long term. This is not something that we are proposing for the next five years, but it's an idea, and you can understand why, of um, a vision of a stable Europe for the future. For now, what we are proposing is this EIB ECB collaboration, that would be very beneficial to the Schwabian housewife whose pension fund is being crushed by the excess liquidity that causes the negative interest rates. It's not Draghi, uh, Draghi is just a messenger. Uh, so I think that it is possible, and I do this because this is why I'm campaigning in Germany as a former Greek finance minister. We, know we need to break the mold of European politics. We need to have transnational politics because we say, look, this is, stop thinking of this as a zero-sum game. It's not the Greeks versus the Germans. Um, half of the German population is finding, finding it today 
harder to make ends meet than they did 10 years ago. And this is a scandal for a country laboring under four surpluses, a trade surplus, a federal government surplus, uh, corporation surplus, and household savings. Uh, so I believe that if we have a genuine conversation, and this is my experience when I'm going around Germany, um, even you know, Christian Democrats and Free Democrats, we can have this conversation, but that conversation has never been had because it has been silenced by the, the, the lie that oh, whenever a non-German voice talks about Euro reform, they want our money. They want Germany to pay for things. Germany is paying for things. My criticism of Germany, of the German political class, is not that they have not been paying for the rest of Europe. My criticism is they've been paying too much and they've been wasting their money. And in the process, you know, they are celebrating a trade surplus which is causing them, forcing them to entrust their savings with foreigners that they are misusing those savings. So in a sense, everybody can get better off if we have this, this conversation. So to answer your question more directly and not to take too long, the first few steps are steps where we can have consensus. Later on, once we establish this consensus and then you have trust building, then you can have, you know, suddenly we, we move beyond the zero-sum game mentality and we can see that there is a common interest. When you say to people that we need a European clearing union, we need to not so much to tax net exports, but to take a percentage of net exports and to recycle it in your interests too. Because if you recycle it within Europe, then you will have to rely less on Chinese demand for your cars and for your gadgets. Again, this has to happen through persuasion, but we must, in order to get there, we need to move beyond the politics of discontent and beyond the politics of biblical economics, where you know you point moralistic fingers at one another. The Germans are looking at the Greeks or the Italians as lazy gits. The Italians and the Germans respond by saying, you know, think of what you did in the 1940s. Uh, we need to move beyond that, to have this rational conversation. This is why I very much welcome today, and I thank you very much for having this conversation with me. I think we should move to the next. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you want to put in any questions from? Uh yeah, no, I'm looking Global to see if some of these have been, uh, have been already uh, raised. Uh, go ahead. I think we need to start with the last, uh, with the last conversation. So, um, so the last, uh, the, the final uh, segment before we go into an open Q&A uh, is about this complex of issues under competition policy, industrial policy, digital policy, which we haven't mentioned yet, um, innovation policy. But you've touched on some of these things. So let's have a conversation about that. Uh, let's start with a very concrete example. Uh, so we had a clash recently in the Alstom Siemens merger uh, question between Commissioner Vestager's view in particular, but the Commission as a whole, as an enforcer of competition policy, and a largely Franco German view that there's a need for national champions. That the argument for national champions have different, has different versions. One is we just need to be big, we need to have European Googles and so on. Another version is we need this to protect ourselves against China. Uh, and there's an additional worry that uh, we are too squeamish about digital rights, data protection and so on to really compete in the new digital economy. Let's start with a very specific Alstom Siemens uh, case and kind of move out from there. If you had been Commission President uh, ruling on that case, what, what, what view would you have taken? I would have come out unequivocally in support of Vestager. Clear enough? So explain why. Because she's why don't, right. Why don't we need champions? Because she's right. I don't like this boyish language about champions that comes out of soccer and football. Uh, no, we don't need champions. What we do need is companies that compete, and in the process of competing, they're investing, they're creating good quality jobs. To create another cartel in Europe is the last thing we need. Mr. Macron and Mrs. Merkel uh, should be ashamed of themselves for coming out with such lazy arguments about European champion. Uh, this is not how Google came about, you know. It did not come about because politicians in California decided to create a Californian or a Silicon Valley champion. It happened organically. It grew out of um, a quite healthy competitive environment that was 
uh, uh, an ecosystem that came out of um, Silicon Valley. This is our, our great failure is that we have a bankocentric investment culture in Europe. Our bankers have been remiss in the way that they have been misusing their capacity to create money, and they have been giving money to uh, fellow bankers in the periphery that have been using corrupt practices in order to build bu bubbles. This is the main reason why we don't, have, we don't have Googles. It is not that we're squeamish about digital rules and about privacy laws. This is something that should, I mean, th think about it. This, th this is a great advantage that we have, that we can carry the population with us and we can constrain corporations so as to work in the public interest. But to cut a long story short, Vestager was completely right. Remember that this European Union began as a cartel of big business. Our first name was the European Communities of Coal and Steel. The whole purpose was to limit competition and to regulate prices uh, with uh, a guaranteed minimum profit rate for large companies. We need to move away from this. Maybe this was the only way that the European Union could begin. If we continue along those lines, cartels are a menace. Cartels cannot handle crisis. The world economy is in a crisis. Cartels are precisely the opposite of what we need. We need to move beyond uh, this mentality that we take together our large companies and we create yet a larger company that is not subject to competition. You're putting consumer welfare at the heart of it. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of sympathy for that. We're protecting competition policy. You has been very successful. And you're saying that we are continuing to do that. But here's a specific problem. We have an ambition. Europe has an ambition to be a global player. That's on one side. Then we have American megamoths that were created as a result of the industrial policy that you just described. And then you have China, which is an emerging economy that, you know, it wants a share of the pie and follows a very different model. Mm -hmm. A model that is not for us to decide whether it's a good model or a bad model. The fact of the matter is, is that it takes away the level playing field. So now you have an ambition as a European politician, as an a beer consumer, to be a global player, but you have to compete with a model that is actually taking away the level playing field. I understand your blue sky thinking, but how do you consider the two? How do you come true to your ambitions, preserve the multilateral system, and at the same time allow China to come into the Europe under huge subsidies? What is the best response for Europe? Well, the best response is not to build cartels. Because as we know from Economics 101, monopoly profits come from restricting supply and from restricting um, the employment of good people doing good things. So you allow so, the Chinese to come in and then they build well, whichever... See, listen, the, the Chinese are coming in because sure. there is a dearth of investment in these continents. Sure. Okay? The reason why they're coming in through Italy, the reason why they went to Portugal, the reason why they are uh, now in Paris, is because we are failing to generate the investment that would give our businesses the opportunity to compete with them. Preserving low levels of investment as we are, while allowing existing large companies to get together is going to reduce aggregate investment, aggregate investment further. It is not, this is, if you, if you want to give President Xi and the Chinese uh, industrial complex a great gift, keep doing what we're doing. So you're not interested in preserving the ambition of Europe to become a global payer in Europe? I'm sorry, the exactly the opposite. All I'm saying is that to have the ambition to become a global player, we need to boost investment so that our young people can have access to funding. Take, for instance, the European Investment Fund, which is part of the uh, European Investment Bank. It was set up 25 years ago in order to provide venture capital to ameliorate for the fact that we have a dearth of capital going to startups and, in particular, capital going into the funding of startups that want to become bigger. We don't have that funding sure. in Europe. So we want more of that. Yeah? That is, if you really want to be ambitious, this is what you're working towards. How this is why that? our plan for investment is an integral part of everything else. Uh, to allow existing corporations hmm. to uh, um, consolidate further is to reduce our ambition. It is not going to allow us to get contracts in... In, in, in the Arab Emirates or in Indonesia or in Singapore that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise. 
we are not going to be able to compete with the German, the German, with the Chinese railway companies if we do that. We will be able to compete if we have a culture of investment in new technologies. We're falling behind automation. We are falling behind all those things. Why? Because of investment, not because we don't have a sufficiently high concentration ratio in an industry. But So somebody could agree with you on the investment question, agree and say, yes, we need a lot more investment, in particular in these innovative industries, and yet disagree on industrial policy and in particular industrial structure. And what they would say is, today, the most efficient scale is now global, not regional, uh, and that's why the lack of scale is why there is no European Google. You know, we use an American search engine, we use American created social media. The same might be true in some high tech physical invent like train, for example. People will say that industrial structure matters because the efficient scale is now global. And if we don't have companies or operations at a global scale, we will not be able to compete, no matter how much investment there is. So why why would somebody saying that be wrong? Well, the reason is, I mean, of course, it's a legitimate position, but it's one that I disagree with very, very strongly. Because I can't see how you can create uh, global, globally successful companies simply by merging existing companies. Uh, if you look at the way that the Chinese companies developed, it's not through consolidation. It is through investment. It is through specialization. Yeah? One company, CSE, got the patent from uh, Kawasaki and Mitsui, and they built a fantastic train that no one had built before. It's not that first they consolidated by bringing together three or four companies and creating more monopoly power within China. It was by going into joint ventures with foreign companies, having innovative ideas, and taking risks, and being funded. This is what we need in Europe. Think of what is happening now, this crime against logic in Germany with the merger talks between Finance Bank, Commerce Bank and, and Deutsche Bank. This is also being portrayed as consolidation to have a global investment bank that, that competes with JP Morgan. Rubbish. This is not going to create a global competitor to JP Morgan. JP Morgan people are looking at this and they are laughing their heads off. Because all we're doing is we're marrying two zombies. The only beneficiaries will be the people who are running them, who are going to use the negative goodwill in order to create paper value from which they will profit with bonuses. The customers in Germany are going to, to suffer because branches will be closed down. Bank employees are going to suffer because they are going to be fired. And we're not going to have a global player in the international markets. So whenever you hear European champions, know that there are vested interests in there working against the interests of Europe. Let's push a bit uh, further on this. I suppose you're right. But given how Europe versus China have behaved, China now has uh, a lead in some sectors. Let's talk about 5G. Because we are right? idiots. So, so what, but what do we do? Don't to, blame the Chinese for this, right? I mean, we have affected fiscal policy and monetary policy for 10 years that has depleted investment in all the competitors of the Chinese. So we created a vacuum and the Chinese are filling it. Stop demonizing China. Yeah, let's look at ourselves in the mirror. I mean, you know, we, are, we Greeks have learned one thing in the last 10 years. It's important to look at ourselves in the mirror before we blame anyone else. But let's do this at the European level. But is a possible result of these errors that it's now too late to keep the Chinese out, to put it that way, uh, without blocking them for a while? So let's talk about 5G specifically. So people who know more about this than I claim that if European uh, telecoms uh, were to use Ericsson or Nokia equipment for 5G, the technology is one or two years behind, you have to use Huawei. What's your take on Huawei? Use it. The, I, the idea that they will be spying on us is laughable. Uh, do you remember, uh, who was it exactly that was tapping Angela Merkel's communications? It was not the Chinese, was it? It was our great friends from the other side of the Atlantic. I know that my phone, um, it, it, I'm, you know, I might as well go on the rooftop and shout things. Uh, <laughs> It's broader. If it, uh, it's not the national security issue. I think the issue is you have big companies in China that have become very big through being SOEs. Now, this is a model. This is a model that China has 
pursuit, for some industries, not for everything, supported that. And this is, the, this is what I meant by the playing field, the level playing field. Now, is this a model perhaps uh, Europe should follow, SOEs, or is that against... We have industry? been following it. What about Alstom? What about you know, even Siemens? It's a private company. But it has relied on the kindness of, of states, of taxpayers. All our great companies, you know, Renault would never have existed if it was not for the French state. You know, to say to the Chinese, oh, they are SOEs, and you know, it's, it's, it's the Chinese Communist Party behind the Chinese state. This notion that there is a distinction between the state and the private sector is delusional. In the United States, they have the most powerful, strong, effective industry policy in the history of capitalism. It's called the military industrial complex. Yeah? Google would not have existed without it. You all know that. You don't need me to go through this. So to, to, to look at the Chinese and say, oh, the state is behind, so they have the level, the, the playing field is not level. It was never level. It was never level in Europe, except the difference is they've been doing it well and we've been doing it badly. Let's do it well without consolidating and strengthening the failures that want to present themselves as European champions. Is, is, is the Belt and Road Initiative a threat to Europe's geostrategic autonomy? No. No. It is an opportunity. But, you know, we, should be, we should always beware anyone with power. As, you know, uh, a small L liberal, I was taught from a very young age that anybody who has exorbitant power is dangerous and we should beware. We should beware of Chinese rising power. We should beware of American power. We should beware of our own power. I mean, you give a large sledgehammer to a small child, you end up with a lot of damage. There's no doubt about that. But when the Chinese come and say we want to invest, let's look at what they are proposing. You know, when they were coming to me when I was in the finance ministry, uh, and they said, oh, we want the port of Piraeus, and we want this. I said, okay, let's sit down. And when you sit down with them, I find this is my personal experience. They're very, very reasonable people if you are prepared to be firm with them. But to say, we're not talking to the Chinese. When we have a global economy where Germany would, would, would just collapse in a, in a heap today without China. How can we dare say, oh, we, we need to stop and block the Chinese when we depend on them? Without China, there would be no capitalism today. In 2008, there were two forces that kept capitalism alive, the Fed and China. So the, all this discussion in Brussels today about how to stop the, the Chinese and the level playing field, it just goes to show we are children. We are not adults yet. We have to grow up and start looking at the world the way it is. Of the time. I, I think, think we should, we should involve, open up, uh, yeah. Do you, do, do you want to bring anything up from I, I'm not, I mean, I think there's quite, there's lots of questions. Can I have a show of hands to see who might like to ask a question? And while I look at the hands, I'll be very clear that we would like questions, not speeches, because we have very little yeah. time and many people want to talk and so on. So I'm going to take a couple of questions and if they're not questions, I will cut you off. Let's the lady gather, here uh, first, please. Uh, oh yeah, do we need to close on? Yeah, sure. It's a, we'll um, share we, we I'll, I'll take a couple of questions. The lady here first, yeah. please. Thank you. Uh, Natasha Arvanetti from the Committee of the Regions. Uh, it's very interesting, everything here. But I have three questions. The oh. first is, well. I would like <laughs> you, to... You get um, one, you get because one. others will have questions too. And I then would we can like come to back hear to your views on the European Minister of Economy and Finance. Do you agree with this or not? The second so. question is, do you think that the Eurozone yeah, needs two. a separate budget? Okay, good. Well, well, we'll take okay, two, questions two questions because okay. we won't have time to. Thank you. And anybody Let's else? Go. Maybe Let's anyone in the back? The gentleman here? Please here. Yes. In front here. I think we need a... But thanks for being so concise. Good morning. Uh, Jorge Valero with your active. Uh, very good questions. Will it be this proposal for a EIB, ECB um, instrument <coughs> Uh, your token or your demand to support an EPP candidate in the European Parliament to become president of the European Commission? I, I didn't get the I didn't get it. Okay, so the question is whether, I mean, let's say that optimism is a duty, but at the end you don't win the European elections and you don't become president of the European yes. Commission. Uh, will it be the proposal for the EIB slash ECB instruments to finance investment, green investment, uh, your demand to support an EPP candidate. Oh. Okay, good question. So, does the Eurozone need a, an economics and finance minister? What about the Eurozone budget? 
And it was a Eurozone budget, right? Yeah. And uh, would, you, would you trade support for a commission president in return for support for these ideas about EIB and uh, ECB back to EIB bonds? That's okay. Uh, no, we are not in favor of a finance minister. And we're not in favor of a finance minister because you can't really seriously have a finance minister without a finance ministry. And you cannot have a finance ministry without a capacity to tax and a capacity to borrow. And to have that capacity to tax and the capacity to borrow, you need to have a federal democracy to be legitimate. I'm all in favor of having a federal democracy. But if we start having this conversation now, people will say, yeah, right, we'll be dead before that happens. So let's start with things we need to do using existing institutions to stabilize the Eurozone. And then start the, a process of debating in um, town halls, in regions, in cities, in Brussels, in the longer term, as to what kind of democratic governance we want to see in the European Union in the next 10 years, what kind of European democratic constitution we want, and whether we want that constitution to include the checks and balances that would enable uh, a European budget a Eurozone budget and a European finance minister. On the second question, the answer is yes. Uh, we don't care who is sitting in that seat. What we care about is policies. We want policies that make sense and that can, that can make a difference to go ahead. So anybody that agrees with, or we can agree, we can have a compromise, of course, on things we consider to be uh, a way forward for Europe, things that will bring us closer together and things that will stop the centrifugal forces that are tearing us apart and giving rise to political monsters across the continent, we will then support whoever plays along with that. So, so just to be clear, you don't at the moment support a Eurozone budget? No, I don't. How can you have a Eurozone budget if you don't... I mean, look, it sounds good, doesn't it? I am a federalist. I want a federation. But I want a democratic federation. I want it to be legitimate. I want a constitution. I, want, I, don't want, you know, I can't read the Lisbon Treaty. It was written in order to destroy the soul of those who, who read it. Okay? I want a, a constitution that is democratic and which creates um, you know, a federal government that we can all vote for and whose decisions can be democratically checked. Until that happens, no. There can be no budget for the Eurozone. This is why Macron's idea uh, was dead in the water even before it was launched. Because, you know, what, what they ended up now with a line in the EU budget, which is macroeconomically insignificant. To have a macroeconomically significant budget, you need democratic legitimacy. So while waiting for that, let's have some investment, seems to be the, the, the position. Exactly. Uh, Maria, do we have any... Yes, uh... actually, if I may here, this is one perhaps some back to the euro reform. The ECB has a mandate defined in EU treaty. Wouldn't it be undemocratic for the ECB to decide by itself to change its mandate? Yes. Nobody's asking for the ECB to change its mandate. It cannot change its mandate. We have to change its mandate. But every proposal you heard from me and every proposal in our European Spring pro uh, process program is completely wholly within the letter of the law. Not necessarily the spirit of the law. Uh, but, you know, that's okay. When, for instance, we propose a debt restructure based on an, an idea that initially came from this fine institution, the red and the blue debts, uh, when we are proposing that the, EI, the ECB um, um, intervenes or go, it bec becomes a go-between member states and investors using issuing ECB bonds in order to provide this loan conversion to reduce the interest payments in the long term for the blue part of the debt, the, the permissible part of the debt. Uh, there is nothing in the ECB charter that prohibits that. The main reason is because they hadn't thought of it when they were writing it. But at least we would not be violating the charter of the ECB and we would be having a therapeutic debt restructure without any losers. So, wh what about the prohibition on a credit line to governments? It wouldn't be a credit line. It would just be bought up. It, the it, it, it would be, um, you know, you, you issue a bond like the Central Bank of Chile does. Uh, you give, to give it to a German or a Chinese investor. You, from that, you finance, you service, you don't purchase, you service part of the Italian bond that matures, and then you have the Italian government pay that to the, you know, re, um, uh, pay for, uh, pay the, the German or the Chinese um, 
investor at the end of the maturity of the ECB bond. This is more legal, more within the rules of the existing charter than what Mr. Draghi has been doing in the last three years. This is where I have to agree with Jens Weidmann. Let's take a few more questions. There's questions here from the floor and there. Hello, uh, my name is Juan Corbalan from Spanish Agri-Food Cooperatives. Uh, why you, do you say uh, in the common policy, agricultural policy is bad? Uh, is, you said uh, at the beginning the common agricultural policy is bad. Uh, why? What did you do as um, Commission President with this common uh, agriculture? It's the only common uh, policy in, in, in Europe. Okay. What, what did you do? What, what to do with the agricultural common policy? Thank you. My name is Todd Buell. I'm a reporter with Law 360. What, what do you think of the Commission's proposal to try to get rid of unanimity on tax rules, you know, to uh, make, go to qualified majority voting? I'll keep the question brief. Yep. Very good question. So it's, since you both have been concise, we'll take the third one, if you're as short as the other ones. Um, yeah, uh, uh, you've, you've mentioned, you've talked a lot about kind of democratic uh, um, accountability. Do you think that the uh, the President of the European Council should be elected by Europeans to ensure that Europe is more than just an economic toolbox and actually the social aspects are brought out much further. Thank you. Very good all right, thank you. Very good questions, all of them. I'll start from the last one. I'm a federalist and a democrat. I do believe, I would like to live in a Europe that has a federal government, which is democratically controlled by a federal parliament, huh? the United States of Europe. But we can't have this conversation now because of the centrifugal forces that are pulling us apart. So to have that, to have the European Commission being elected by the peoples of Europe, you have to have a constitution. Now that will take a long time. First, we need to stabilize Europe. We need to stop the centrifugal forces. We have to defeat Brexit or Brexit-like moves. We need to de defeat the fascists that are rising up throughout um, um, Europe and who will do unfortunately very well in May. Huh? So we need to do that. We have our work cut out for us as European Democrats before we can begin to have this conversation. Uh, on your question, I... My, my, so the answer is no, not yet. Not yet. We need first to stabilize before we can start building. We need a solid foundation that we're lacking. Uh, the, on, on, on your question, I agree. I think we need to have harmonization and we should move away from uh, veto power. And qualified majority voting is a good way of moving towards it. I would even go even more in the direction of majority voting. With this, in your view, would you apply this to some particular parts of the tax structure or tax generally? I mean, are you talking corporate tax? Corporate tax and, and VAT. Corporate tax and VAT. Yeah. Uh, and then we can talk about carbon taxes as well. Yeah. And then... Agricultural, agricultural policy. And I'll come to that, but also I wanted to add in throw in inheritance tax, because it's the only sensible wealth tax there is. You but anyway, this is... European I would. And it is part of our program. Uh, common agricultural policy, you... Uh, right. Well, it is, it is good that we have a common agricultural policy. It's terrible that we have this common agricultural policy. Because now we are paying people to uh, not produce, and we are paying uh, in, in, indiscriminately and independently of the quality and the greenness of uh, the methods that are being used. Now, you know, I was in Crete, which is where I, my family originally comes from recently, and I was appalled to find that all the stock of local seeds has been depleted because of Bayer Monsanto. Cretan civilization for 5,000 years has had a variety of different, you know, genetic, uh, um, genetically unique uh, uh, plants and vegetables and so on. Now that's this goal gone and this is because of the way that the common agricultural policy has misdirected funding. I think we have time for another round. You've been so wonderfully concise. So there's a lady there. The, the, the gentleman here, I'm talking about the questioners. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and the lady here can have her third question if she still wants it. Hello, I'm um, Alessia Del Vasto from Positive Money Europe, and I uh, have a question regarding the European Central Bank. More than once you stated that we need a more transparent and accountable ECB. Can you keep your voice in the microphone close to your mouth? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, which are your concrete proposals concerning that? So transparency and accountability of the European Central Bank. 
Thank you. Uh, Javier Dot from Spain, Mr. Varoufakis, if you um, could change one thing of your political activity as Greek finance minister, what would you, what would you change? That's a good and concise question. The lady, if you want your third question. Uh, thank you. Coming from the Committee of the Regions, I would like to ask you, as the next Commission President, would you take the Task Force for Subsidiarity one step further? Thank you. Thanks. Gregory from Bruegel. Uh, so the EIB plan seems to be uh, really like the silver bullet in your, in your proposal. Uh, but the thing is that the decisions at the EIB are taken by the Board of Governors, which are basically the finance ministers of the EU. How do you convince them to adopt your plan? Because uh, the president of the commission or the commission cannot do anything uh, to direct uh, EIB investment. Very good. Excellent questions. I'll start from the personal one you asked me. What would I have done differently? Well, lots of things, but if you ask me to say one, I say I would not sign the interim agreement. I would, should not have signed the interim agreement with the Eurogroup on the 24th of February 2015. The reason being that, um, unfortunately, my colleagues, we had a good agreement four days before uh, to replace the MOU with uh, a list of reforms that we would write from scratch. We went through that, we put it together, and then they introduced the MOU through the back door again. And at that point, I should have said, no, I'm not signing. Uh, since you asked. Um, <laughs> I, I'm tempted to say other things, but I won't. Um, <laughs> on the question of the European Investment Bank, starting from that last one, well, let me, let me just tell you a story, a brief one, don't worry. When I was a uh, finance minister, I was, of course, a governor of the AIB, and I put forward this proposal. And I was astonished by the fact that no one disagreed. Some didn't have an opinion to say, but Werner Hoyer and others said, this is a great idea, we have to pursue it. But, but, this is not something that we can decide on our own. We need the green light from the council. This is why we need politics to legitimize the EIB from doing that. The EIB cannot take, make this decision on its own. It needs a green light, but I can assure you that the European Investment Bank people, firstly, have the capacity to do it, and secondly, they would be very open to the idea of doing it, and they would very some of them would be very keen to do it, including finance ministers, because it would give them a lot of degrees of freedom in their own home countries. Because, you see, we, have the, we labor under this illusion that there is a tug of war, a zero-sum game between sovereignty at the, in, the, in our capitals, in our nation states, and sovereignty in Brussels. At the moment, we have a weak EU and we have weak parliaments and governments. There, it's not a zero-sum game. If we have this investment program across Europe. That gives more degrees of freedom uh, to the national capitals, to our nation states. Uh, on the question of regions, this is a, a central plank in the European Springs and Diems program. I think that it's high time that the centrality of national governments should be sidestepped, should, should be pushed aside. It is important for municipalities, for regions, to have direct link with Brussels. It should be possible for Brussels to fund uh, regions directly uh, on the basis of business plans that make sense. Maybe in the context of the Green Transition Works Agency, this is something we could do. But to have uh, regional developmental plans remain hostage of national governments um, is a major loss of opportunity for our regions and for our Europe. And finally, uh, you asked me about transparency of the European Central Bank. Some of you may know that there was a very interesting story that emerged in 2015. After I, after I resigned, somebody called me, I don't know whom, it was an anonymous telephone call from within the European Central, ba Central Bank to inform me that um, President Mario Draghi of the ECB was so worried before 
switching off ELA liquidity to the Greek banks, that he didn't trust the legal department within the European Central Bank, which is a very good legal department. I assume it's a very good legal department. It's very expensive and very large. Uh, and he commissioned uh, a, a legal opinion from a private firm. He needed a backup before switching off ELA. When we found that out, Fabio De Masi, member of the European Parliament and myself, uh, wrote to Mr. Draghi and we asked to see the legal opinion. If it was legal what you did, show us the legal opinion. It was purchased on the, you know, using European funds. Maybe European citizens should be able to look at it. He said, no, because of confidentiality, which is a joke, of course. You know, uh, attorney, client, privilege. Now, that's, that's, what a lib uh, uh, that's what a lawyer tells you. Uh, but when you go to the client and say, look, you paid with my money for this, I want to see what the lawyer said to you. Uh, confidentiality does not hold. So we took the matter further. Uh, we collected 35,000 signatures. Uh, now we, are, we lost the case at the, uh, at the European courts. We are going to move to the European Court of Justice. Think about it. We have enabled a central bank, which is outside the political process, for better or for worse, we have enabled to shut down the banking system of a member state of the EU, of the Eurozone. Yeah? And we don't even have the right as European citizens to find out what the legal opinion on such acts of exorbitant power was. That is not good because such lack of transparency is not consistent with a democratic regime. We are very quickly coming to an end, actually, but uh, there is a question here which is very fitting, I think, for us closing this. Uh, and it is about where you see Europe in the next 10 years. Now, note, it's not about where you want it to be. That, I think, we gave us a flavor, but where do you think it's going in the next 10 years? It is a political decision of mine to refuse to answer. And I'll, let you, I'll tell you why. I will explain it why. Because, Question. because, you see, it's not like predicting the weather. The beauty of natural science is that the weather doesn't give a damn about what we think. It will do whatever it will do. And then we can use our predictions and the discrepancy between what we predict and the weather in order to test the theory and to improve our scientific meteorological processes. But when it comes to politics, when it comes to our Europe, what we think determines what we do and what we do shapes the future. So we have a moral right to abstain from predictions and to concentrate on doing that which we think is right. Thank you all for coming. Mr. Varvakis, thank you very much for kick-starting the discussion. I wish you best of luck in your electoral campaign. Join us in the next event next week. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.